And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great personal pride for me and for the Harry S. Truman Foundation that I welcome to our distinguished list of honorees the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Thomas P. O'Neill, Jr. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Many years ago, Sam Rabin, when he was Speaker of the House, he appointed me to a commission to go to Ireland for the dedication of the statue of John Barry. Well, if you went to a parochial school like I did, you knew that John Barry was the father of the American Navy. If you went to the public school, you probably believed that John Paul Jones was the father of the American Navy. <laughs> I arrived in Cork, my wife Millie, the home of my forebears, had never been there before. I was met by a State Department person, and uh, it was about five days before the dedication. What would you like to see? I'd like to see as much of, of that section of Ireland that I could because my parents had come from there on my dad's side. So I went up uh, to the Blarney Castle and I kissed the Blarney Stone. Uh, I saw the uh, the famous river and the bells of Shandon. Went to the marketplace, very, very picturesque, the women with their shawls, and the grass and so green in the landscape. And we're riding along and suddenly the driver stopped the car. And I asked him why, he said, I want to show you the hospital. He said, this hospital, he said, uh, is our local hospital. He said, very interesting story. 1929, Henry Ford visited Cork Island the home of his mother and dad. He had never been there before. That afternoon, he's in the hotel and knock at the door, a group of men. They said, Mr. Ford, we want to welcome you. We're honored that you should be here, one of the great industrialists of this world, one of the great manufacturers, one of the great inventors, one of the great philanthropists. We're building a hospital in this town. We thought perhaps in memory of your mother and dad, you'd like to make a donation. Ford sat down, wrote out a donation for $5,000, and he gave it to them. Following day, the Cork Courier, the newspaper, came out with a blazing head headline that said, Henry Ford donates $50,000 to hospital. <laughs> that afternoon, knock at the door, the same group of men, they said, Mr. Ford, we're grateful for the $5,000 that you gave us. Tomorrow, the Courier will make a correction. <laughs> Ford looked at him and said, what does it cost to build a hospital? They said, $50,000. He said, give me my check back. <laughs> Took the check, tore it up. Sat down, wrote out a check for $50,000. He said, here's a check for $50,000 that you may have to build that hospital on one condition. And those Irishmen didn't care what the condition was. <laughs> he said, over the portals of the hospital, I want the inscription that I have in mind. And it reads, I came among you, and you took me in. <laughs> Thanks for the warmth of a fine introduction, Bill. I'm very, very grateful, and I'm grateful for the way I have been received here today. Mr. Henry Talge, you are indeed quite a man. If this is your brainchild, you should indeed, among the many things that you have accomplished, you should be gratefully proud of this. I am wearing... I am delighted that I have uh, in my company here Ike Skelton, who uh, on Saturday is going down to Big Mo and be one of the speakers representing the government of the United States. What is it, a rededication? Rede the rededication. So that's Congressman Ike Skelton. The mayor of the city very graciously came over and he gave me a key, and I'm very, very grateful to you, Mr. Mayor. I have a really good some collection of these, and I always look with pride. Mrs. Bourne, your remarks were beautiful indeed, and I want to thank you for part of the kind welcome. Members of the Democratic Corps, the distinguished visitors from overseas, the veterans that are here, the friends and neighbors of Harry Truman, and particularly the medal recipients, I want to uh, congratulate, them, congratulate them. 38 years ago, this November, 
our country saw the greatest come behind victory in political history. Never before have the press, the pollsters, the politicians been so wrong, so surprised by the outcome of an election. This is a nonpartisan affair today, but I have to say that it was a thr I was thrilled with Mr. Truman's victory. In fact, it helped make my career. At that time, I was a member of the Massachusetts legislature. I was the leader of my party, the Democratic Party, and we were in the minority. I was determined to try to change that, and I worked hard for Harry in that campaign. We Democrats knew what we were up against. The legislature had been controlled by the other party for generations. There never had been a Democrat. Our only hope was a tremendous victory for the national ticket, Harry Truman and Alvin Barkley. As election day arrived, we all knew it was going to be close in our state. The press was still calling it for Dewey, but those of us who followed the election closely knew that the president had waged an unprecedented campaign. He had whistle stopped across America like a man who didn't know when to quit. It was the other fellow, Governor Dewey, who campaigned like he had it all wrapped up. It was he who acted like the incumbent. It was the president who ran frightened and scared. Well, Harry Truman was right. The press and the pollsters were wrong. He waged the loneliest, and uh, the loneliest campaign, they called it, and as it turned out, the best presidential campaign in the history of this nation. He carried not only the White House, not only the Congress of the United States, but he also helped us elect a Democratic governor in Massachusetts and for the first time carry the Massachusetts legislature. I'm glad to come to the home of Harry Truman to pay tribute to the man whose courageous campaign helped me become the first Democratic speaker in the history of Massachusetts. This luncheon honors the cont contributions Mr. Truman made to our country. No man in our history was more committed to democracy, the right of the average person to control their own national destiny. No man would be more proud of the recent and peaceful triumphs of democracy in so many nations of the world, long dominated by strife and dictatorship. First, I want to talk about Harry Truman's achievement that is not well known. Oh, it's been mentioned a couple of times here today. A permanent contribution he made to our American system of government. President Truman served on Capitol Hill for 10 years as a senator from Missouri and later for three short months as its vice president, the presiding officer of the Senate. He was a man who understood the valued and, and valued the important role of our systems of checks and balances among the various branches of our government. He said in his later years that he loved the Senate and he had hoped to spend the rest of his life and his career on Capitol Hill. But that was not to be the case. In 1944, this hardworking legislator was called to a different role. With the nations still at war, he was selected as President Roosevelt's running mate. He and many others knew that his selection could well be more critical than that. In joining the national ticket in 1944, he was placed on the threshold of history, whether he wanted to be or not. No man in our history was more aware of what it meant to be a heartbeat away from the presidency. Mr. Truman became the vice president on January 20th. 86 days later, he was relaxing in the private capital office of the House of the Speaker of the House, Sam Raymond. That room has long had the nickname, the Board of Education. It was there that the speaker would invite members to join him at the end of each day for some political conversation, and on some occasions, a nip or two. It was in this quiet little room on the first floor of the Capitol that President Truman received a message on April 12th. 1945 to call the White House. The message was from Steve Early, the President's press secretary. 
When Mr. Truman got him on the phone, he was told to come to the White House quickly and as quietly as possible. The rest is history. Harry Truman has gone down on the history books as one of the greatest presidents of all time, and his reputation grows bigger and stronger every year. Much has been written about the great decisions made by President Truman. Unfortunately, there is one such decision that is not as well known. It affects the order of the presidential succession. At the time Mr. Truman became president, the order of the presidential succession went from president to vice president to the members of the president's cabinet. Mr. Truman did not feel that this was right, correct, or fair. He did not feel it was right for a government appointee to become the president of the United States. He felt that the Speaker of the House, who was elected to the Congress by the voters of his district and elected to the speakership by the members of the House, should be next in line for the presidential succession. Not surprisingly, the House of Representatives agreed with him and approved the new legislation almost immediately. The Senate, however, rejected the idea. Apparently, the senators did not like the idea of the speaker being next in line. Two years later, after the Republicans won control of the House, the Senate changed its mind and agreed to make the speaker next in succession. The speaker by this time was an old pal and friend of mine, Joe Martin of Massachusetts, but he happened to be a Republican. It's a tribute to Harry Truman that he did not change his mind about the matter of print about a matter of principle simply because the power over the House of Representatives have shifted from one party to another. He believed completely in the rightness of democratic government. He believed that the closer, the closer government is kept to the people, the better it is for our, our country. It is not the hand that signs the law that holds the destiny of America, Harry said. It is the hand that casts the ballot because members of the House must face each other and face re-election every two years. He believed that they are the most responsive to the American people. It is only right, he believed, that the order of presidential should, succession should proceed to the House. And that is one of the, the things that really in Harry's, history, in Harry's history that people hardly mention. Harry Truman believed in democracy not just for this country, but for the, as the best possible form of government that was ever developed. He also believed that nations should respect each other, that they should treat each other with mutual dignity. The United Nations, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, the Point Four Program, the continuation of the Good Neighbor Policy are all monuments to the administration of Harry Truman. Recently, I had the unique opportunity to see how much the Roosevelt Truman of the third democratic world is becoming a reality. Responding to invitations that I received in South America, I took a bipartisan congressional delegation. We visit some of the rising democracies in, a, in the South, Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, and the Dominican Republic. We met with legislators like ourselves. We met with members of the House and the Senate of these countries. We met with their presidents and vice presidents and the speakers of the House. All of them committed to democratic government, to free elections, to human rights, and a free press. It was a stirring experience. For years, we Americans have gotten into the habit of viewing Latin America as a land beset by revolution a land where dictatorships rise and fall, leaving nothing but re recession and repression and empty promises in their path. Fortunately, in my opinion, that is no longer an accurate picture of the giant and diverse world to our South. Today, 90% of Latin America is either democratic or in the process of becoming democratic. One by one, the dictatorships of Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil have given away to the democratically elected governments. Rather than being alone in this hemisphere, 
The United States is now part of a democratic majority in the Americas. In the past four years, counting all the countries of this hemisphere, almost one third of a billion people have voted in some three dozen national elections in 27 countries. There are many more people voting in those elections than ever voted before combined in the history of this hemisphere. So much for the past generations. We in this country have tended to focus on what divides the peoples and the nations of the Americas. Our attention has been focused almost entirely on Europe, the home of ancestry for so many of us here in America. With the rise of democracy, with the growing respect of human rights, the barrier of communications between North and South are being removed. Democracy is not only the means of building strength out of diversity, it also helps build the spirit of cooperation among nations. The economic news is also positive in South America. While South American countries face serious debt problems, they have the resources and the export capabilities to meet these challenges. As we saw on our visits, they also now have the strong, committed democratic leaders to face up to their challenges, to take the tough but necessary steps to ensure stable economic expansion. We refer to these countries, of course, as the third world, but a number are on the verge of joining the economic first world. They have developed in great strides, and while they still face many obstacles, they have a real opportunity to leave the ranks of the developing nation and join those of us who are in the developed world. If the right policies are followed, they could do it sometime, they could at some time in the future be facing North as economic equals of the United States. I make this point about the rise of democracy in the world because too often we focus only on the crisis areas. We look at Cuba and Nicaragua and Chile and Paraguay and forget that these governments of the far left and the far right have become the exception in Latin America and in South America. In a hemisphere where democracy is flourishing, these dictatorships have become the odd men out. Our greatest goal should be to encourage the spectacular growth of democracy. To do that, we need to learn from our success as well as our failures. Robert Donovan, Harry Truman's great biographer, wrote that President Truman believed the main vehicle of America influence abroad was not military, but economic. He forestalled the communist gains in Western Europe by sending food, not guns, to the nation devastated by World War II. His point four program helped the free world, free people of the world produce through their own efforts more food, more clothing, more materials, and more mechanical power. This hemisphere is moving towards de democracy today, not because of America firepower, but because the people themselves believe in democracy. It is also because our country has tried to foster democracy in Latin America through the good neighbor policy, through point four, through President Kennedy's Alliance for Progress and Jimmy Carter's strong commitment to human rights. I recently met with President Alfonsin of Argentina. President Alfonsin of Argentina has said publicly that his country would never have restored democracy without the relentless campaign that Jimmy Carter as president waged for the principles of human right, not only in the Soviet Union, but among the nations of this hemisphere. Too often, we in this country focus on what is bad, what is going wrong in the world. Too often, we focus on what divides us. Too often, we focus on what we're against. It is time we look at something that is going well in the world today. Democracy is a fact of life in Portugal and Spain and Greece. It's proceeding in the Philippines. Yes, and it has an opportunity to take hold in Haiti. I'm happy to join with you in honoring the great American leader. 
I humbly receive and proudly receive the Harry Truman Good Neighbor Award. But the greatest monument to this great man is the recent progress of the form of government that is really very simple. It is a government that represents the average person, speaks for him, and protects his interest. Harry Truman once said that it is the responsibility of the giant states not to dominate the world, but to serve it. Today, I am proud to join you in paying tribute to that service and to a great man, one of the great men in the history of this country who makes us all proud to be an American. Thank you.